Hi everybody, this is Kevin, and welcome back to another video, and today I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky 2nd Chapter, which after beating this game a few hours ago, I can confidently say that it is a masterpiece, and now one of my top 10 favorite games of all time. I absolutely love this game. And I can't wait to talk about it. That's why I'm recording this video before I even start Sky the Third, which I will be starting either tonight or tomorrow, because I can't get enough of the Trails series. <laughs> but anyway, so by its name, second chapter, it takes place immediately after first chapter, which ended on a, a crazy cliffhanger, which uh, we're going to have to touch on that early on just to give some more context for the story here. Uh, although that does spoil the ending of first chapter. So with this video, I'm assuming you've played at least first chapter and know the twist and the ending. But for second chapter, I will give you a fair warning for the spoilers uh, around the second half of this video. But yeah, it's meant to be played as one whole game. Um, first chapter probably take you around 40 hours. It took me like 55 hours because I went out of my way to talk to every NPC and do all the side quests available. Um... You know, <laughs> I like to get the most out of my games. And second chapter actually took me 90 hours. And again, I, you know, talked to everybody, tried to do every side quest, tried to catch all the fish, which, yeah, there's a... Uh, well, there was fishing in the first game, too, but not like it is here where you have a log to, you know, chronicle which fish you catch in which areas and that whole thing. And that, that adds to Estelle's character quite a bit, that's for sure. Which, yeah, all the characters you met in the first game, they all return... Uh, you get a few new party members, and you really see these guys grow, and it's like, these characters are all written so well. And again, I already said Trails in the Sky 2nd Chapter, top 10 game of all time for me. Estelle Bright is my favorite female protagonist of all time. She is. She passed Velvet Crow. Estelle Bright, number one. My favorite female protagonist of all time. So, we'll put, we're throwing that out there. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it takes place immediately after first chapter. Uh, the combat is more or less the same. You have, like, chain attacks now. So, you know, the first game you have tactical battles. You move on a grid. You can do your attacks, your, your S-crafts, your magic, etc., etc. But now you have chain attacks where early on you can get two characters to do a, an attack together. As you get more levels up three, and then later on in the game, four attacks, which is even more powerful than some of the S-crafts later on. Really cool against boss fights. Uh, you start the game where you left off. I think I was level 38 at the end of FC, which normally in a video game, like a JRPG like that, you'll end, what, around level 50, level 60. But for me, I was around, I think level 38, or maybe 40. Maybe they bump you up to level 40 regardless. But yeah, your, your level carries over with you, so when you start the game, uh, you know, you boot up your, your save file, it, it brings that over, and you have your orbaments in the very beginning, you know, your different crafts and all that, your spells, but as it progresses, as you get to the prologue, it's like, oh, these don't work anymore, we have this new state-of-the-art technology and these new orbaments, so that was a way to sort of reset that, which I can kind of understand. But it was cool that they kept the levels and the S-Crafts. Because, you know, you learn more powerful S-Crafts as you go about the game. And now they get upgraded where, the, where it's called, like, True Hurricane Rush. Uh, True Pummel. True um, Barrage. That's the other one for Estelle. And then you learn even more powerful ones later on toward the final chapters. So, alright, well, <laughs> if you haven't played Sky FC, I guess uh, we'll have to have timestamps in the videos. But, uh... If you haven't played FC, we, we got to talk about the ending there. 
and that's the fact that that innocent Professor Alba was the big villain all along, and he revealed himself to be Professor George Weissman, one of the Anjuists, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, number three in Ouroboros, and they also said it's the Seven Snake Apostles, so he's, he's one of seven who serves under this, I guess, dude named the Grand Master of Ouroboros, and then beneath all them are the Enforcers, and I think it goes up to 15, because there's a character we meet here who is number 15. We also meet number zero, so maybe there's more than, than zero, but we meet maybe four or five of the Enforcers, and I'm assuming their rank is just based on their power levels. That seemed to make the most sense to me, based on who we fought. And, you know, Ouroboros is going around. Not really the, the whole group of Ouroboros, but Weissman is leading this group into the barrel to invoke his plan of bringing forth, uh, we'll say, a weapon for now. <laughs> right? And it, it, it's really cool, like, the particular enforcers and, and the other villainous characters they bring forth in this game, because most of them have a connection to our main cast of characters, and I really like that. We'll get into that more in the spoiler section. But yet, Joshua, it was revealed that he was part of Ouroboros, the Black Fang, and... He had suppressed his memories to a degree, uh, where way back when, when he was a young boy, he attempted to kill Cassius Bright, Estelle's father, but then, you know, when he was seen as useless, they were going to kill him, or Ouroboros was going to kill him, and Cassius came to rescue the boy and take him in as his adoptive son, and he looked after him for, for many years, um, but once he encountered Weissman at the end of first chapter, it, it sort of caused all these memories to go back to Joshua, and he decided to go his own way and deal with Ouroboros without harming Estelle or Cassius or any of his other friends that he met along the way. So Estelle's beside herself because, you know, th this is sort of a touchy subject as well. I don't mind it at all. I'm all for the Joshua Estelle ship. Uh, I guess it's more catted now than a ship, but, you know, they're brought up as, <laughs> as brother and sister, okay, for five years. Uh, but the two of them have feelings for one another. They love each other. And uh, Joshua gives Estelle a kiss at the very end of first chapter with a sedative, which makes her pass out so he can, he can escape and go after Ouroboros in his own way. And so Estelle wakes up in the castle wondering what to do. Where's Joshua? Talking to Shara, talking to Cassius, talking to Chloe, talking to everyone there. And they don't know where he went, so... Uh, Estelle wants to come to terms with, with what to do to look for Joshua and find out where he went. So there's a really touching scene when she's on the airship making her way back to Roland, her hometown, where we meet this character named Father Kevin Graham. And, dude, I love the fact that there's a character in the game named after me. And he turns out to be one of the, the awesome characters in the game, that's for sure. So... He's this, he says he's this wandering priest for the Septian Church. And, you know, he's he's comforting Estelle. She's, she's crying because, you know, Joshua left her and she doesn't know what to do. And he agrees to comfort her. And it's, it's really sweet. This is like, people always talk about the Trail series, how there's so much lore in it. But once you go back to Roland, you can avoid all the NPCs if you want to. But someone like me, I love talking to the NPCs. So you talk to them all. They get these animated expressions where the explanation mark goes up on their head. Uh, it's like, oh, Estelle, we haven't seen you in so long. How are you, Estelle? Da, 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 da. And she she runs back to her her hometown, her um, her house. And is like, oh, if Joshua left, he had to have stopped here, you know, before going on his journey, right? And she's looking all over the place and can't find Joshua. And then she, she lets it all out again, starts crying. And it's like, no, poor Estelle. And so, with, with the help of Kevin, Cassius, and Shara, they talk to her and say, you know, you're still a junior bracer. Why don't you go away and, and practice your training for a while with this girl, Annalise, who we met in the first game as well. And you guys can hone your skills and then work together and look for Joshua and, and figure out what the deal is with this Ouroboros group. So, Estelle has this new resolve in her heart to go and train for a month. And, and gain new abilities and meet new friends. And really, very good prologue. I, I love the title of all the chapters, too. The prologue was called A Maiden's Resolve. 
So after the prologue, you meet some other characters from the, the first game, like Kurt, who's a senior bracer, and they do the training. Lots of good stuff there. You get the introduction to, to Jaegers, who, um, you know, <laughs> the twist here is that the, the bracers are sort of pretending to be Jaegers just to have a test for Estelle and Annalise. Uh, but later on, there are actual Jaegers and they're villains. They, uh... It's, I'm, I'm kind of confused about them still because it seems like they're mercenaries, but there's some Jaegers who work for Ouroboros, so maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong there. But, yeah, the first few chapters, another thing, too, in, in first chapter, there was the prologue, three chapters, and the finale. In this game, there's a prologue, eight chapters, and then the finale, so a lot more meat on the bones. But, um, you know, the first... I want to say three chapters, you're going around and you meet all the friends you met in the first game. Uh, after the prologue, after you do your training for a month, you have the option to decide if you want to go on your adventure with Shara or you go on the adventure with Agate. Now, I chose Agate just because, you know, I like Shara, absolutely. Who doesn't like Shara? <laughs> but I chose Agate, one, because he's a physical attacker. He's probably the strongest in the first game anyway. And I just felt like that whole dynamic was, just made more sense for the young Estelle to travel with the hardened Agate, you know? Like, he, he's... I think Estelle's 16 and Agate's 25 or something, so he's like 10 years older than her. He's got more experience. I mean, Cher is older too, but it, to me it just made more sense for Estelle to tag along with Agate in the beginning. And then Annalise goes with Cher or vice versa, whoever you decide to go with. And, you know, based on who you choose... There's all these different dialogue choices, and with the first game, I, I really, I liked in the first game how, as you went about it, it told you who was in the party, like, okay, it's always Estelle and Joshua, and then uh, Olivia joins, or Shara joins, Age joins, they leave for a bit, then they come back, and then the final chapter, the final dungeon, then you can choose the party, whatever you want. Whereas in this game, right away, you're getting the choice. Do you want Shara, or do you want Age? And then I think the next person to join is Chloe, right? She joins again. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> Olivier, which, yeah, so many plot threads continue from, from first chapter to second chapter. Like, for instance, in Rouen, the mayor was, was uh, outed as, you know, he was the one who burned down the orphanage, right? Like, holy shit, dude. So he was ousted, and there's a new, um, two new mayor candidates going at it. And they're having a fight on the bridge, like, both sides, both parties are arguing with each other. And then out of nowhere, you hear you hear the loot playing, and Olivier shows up in a boat like, Oh, calm down, citizens of Liberal. Don't, don't resort to these petty arguments. Let me play you a song. And he starts playing a song, and it's like, Oh, Olivier. And, you know, I wonder, because like I said, I chose Agi. But the dialogue was so funny between Agi and Olivier, because, you know, he's just a joker, and Agi's all serious. And Agate, you know, he sort of has a thing for all women, and to a certain extent, I guess, some men, because he's, he was hitting on Agate and Mueller, too. But he definitely has a thing for Shara, without a doubt. You, you, you can see that, they're drinking buddies. <laughs> so I wonder what would have happened if I chose Shara instead, but I, I didn't regret the dialogue choice with, with, with Agate. So another great thing I liked about the game is the fact that Libero isn't really a big area to explore. There's five major cities, five major, major regions, I should say, and we explored all of them in first chapter. There's a few new areas here and there, but for the most part, we've explored every area, and it's all about, you know, going back to where we've been before, checking in on the Bracer Guild, seeing, oh, what can we do for you, taking care of the requests, talking to all the NPCs, seeing how characters have changed, like we see Niall and Dorothy again, who are part of the newspaper, and it's like... Oh man, these are some of the first characters we met in first chapter. Uh, we see the Ravens, right, who are in Ruan. They're these group of, not really bandits, but we'll say ruffians. They were always causing problems for people. And, and now they're trying to reform themselves. And some of them are even contemplating, oh, you know, Agate, he was part of our group way back when. He became a, a bracer. How about we become bracers? There's an area later in the game where some sort of catastrophe happens. And they step up and they're helping the townspeople. So it's like, man, these guys, all this character development, even for the NPCs, like I loved it.
you're just going around, you know, checking on the Bracer Guild, seeing what requests they have, seeing if there's any leads for Joshua. Similar to the first game, in between each chapter, you either see Ouroboros scheming or Joshua uh, doing whatever he's doing, which I, I guess I'll mention that because this happens really early in the game, too. Joshua is working with the Kapua Sky Bandits, Josette, Don, and Kyle. And right away, they're in an er Erebonian town called Hamel, or village, or whatever you call it, visiting a grave. And uh, that's very significant for later on in the story, for the spoiler section. But it's like, right away, it's like, damn. And, and Joshua has this new look where he has this scarf on. He's wearing, you can see his sleeves. He's got this tattoo. It's like, damn, look at Joshua, the edgy boy. <laughs> but the tattoo also has some beauty. Again, we'll have to save that for the spoilers. Now I just want to go through some of the villains here. I'm just going to name them. And then later on in the spoiler section, I'll go into greater detail with them. But as you know... It is the villainous group known as Ouroboros, and we got the name drop for that at the end of first chapter from who we thought was Professor Alba, although he said, no, 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 I'm not Professor Alba, I am Professor George Weissman, the third Anduous, which he also said he's one of the seven snake apostles, so maybe Anduous is one of the snake apostles. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe there's seven of them. Uh, they name drop the Grandmaster quite a bit, who I'm assuming is the leader of Ouroboros. We don't see the Grandmaster, but we, we hear the name quite a bit. So there's that. There's also the Enforcers, which I want to say there's 15 of them, but I have no idea because there's also Enforcer Zero. Uh, in this game, we meet five of them. And... Uh, one of them is number 15, but there's also a, a number zero, so <laughs> there could be there could be 30 enforcers. I have no idea. So we'll go through them real quick. Uh, starting off number zero, Campanella, who was a very interesting character. One, just because look at him. I mean, he, he looks like a child, and he, he calls himself Campanella the Fool, and he shows up all throughout the game saying, Oh, I'm just here to observe. I'm not fighting you. I'm here to observe. I was sent by the Grandmaster. And he never engages with our heroes. He just sort of talks to them and taunts them a little, gives them some breadcrumbs. However, his subordinates, whenever they mess up, he, like, lights them on fire and shit. It's like, what the hell is this problem? So he never attacks our heroes, but anytime one of his subordinates is, is screwing up, he's like, oh, to hell if you, like, he's overseeing some Jaegers. He's like, oh, you guys suck, and, like, lights them on fire. So, we got Campanella. I'm sure we'll be seeing him later on in the other Trails games. We have Leonhart, number two, who also goes by the name of Lo. I'm also assuming with the Enforcers, like, their number, is that their rank, as in their power level? That'd be that'd be pretty interesting, because Lo was, was the most powerful one we fought in the game, I'd say. Maybe, maybe Campanella is even stronger if he's number zero. We have number six, Luciolo. Number eight, Walter. Number ten, Phantom Feath Blue Blanc, and number 15, Ren. So, lots of interesting characters. I got a lot to say about Ren, and also I guess we can include Joshua. I think he was, was he Enforcer number 13? I think that's what he was. So, lots of Enforcers, lots of cool characters. One more thing I wanted to mention before I get into the spoiler section of this video, is just how well they handled the character Father Kevin Graham. And I'm not just saying that because we share the same name. He is legitimately one of the best characters in this game. I love him. But it starts out where it's like, okay, this is a new party member, so we're going to slowly introduce him, all his, his quirks and whatnot. Oh, he's a traveling priest, but he's hitting on all the girls, you know, <laughs> that whole thing. And he's there early on to console Estelle, tell her everything's okay, and, and set her on her way to train for a month and continue her journey. And then we see him again in, I want to say, either Chapter 1 or Chapter 2, and... Estelle and the gang are making their way to the orphanage, and they see Matron Teresa, who says, oh, the children went to the nearby village, and they're being taught a lesson by uh, the, this wandering priest, Father Kevin. So, Estelle and the gang make their way to the village, and they see Father Kevin is, is reading a story to the kids, and as Estelle walks in, he's like, oh, you saved me, I've been reading here for hours, what's going on? So, we see Kevin again, it's like, okay, let's go to the next town, and then... He leaves again, and we get a, like an intermission scene where at first you think it's just us, the player, watching this because it's Blue Blanc and Lowe scheming, talking about the gospel plan. 
But as they continue to talk, Lo mentions that someone is eavesdropping on their conversation. And it's like, oh, who is that? Is it Joshua? Is he making his move? And as they're ready to strike whoever this eavesdropper is, there's civilians who are making their way into the scene. And despite Ouroboros being a bunch of bad guys, they don't necessarily go out of their way to kill innocent civilians unless it's part of the gospel plan or, or Weissman or, or whatever. Like, they're not just going to kill people for the fun of it. I mean, maybe some of them will. But Lo has a certain sense of integrity to him. And Blue Blanc sort of like stuck in with people with his, his uh, Phantom Thief clues and all of that. So they're not about to kill innocent civilians. And they see these people walk by. And it's like, okay, let's make our escape. And as they leave... The camera pans around behind this warehouse, and we see Father Kevin with the crossbow at the ready, ready to attack Ouroboros. And he's like, wow, they saved me. So it's like, damn, Father Kevin is not this useless, bumbling, wandering priest. There's more to him than meets the eye. And they handled his character so well, giving this like these breadcrumbs of mystery. And it's like, man, this guy is a major player. So we'll get to more of him in the spoiler section. So another thing I have to mention is the excellent soundtrack in this game. And if you watch my review for first chapter, you know I praise the soundtrack there. But it is even better here because, number one, they bring back all the great songs from first chapter. All the, the specific songs for the towns, like for Ruan and Zweis and, and all the, you know, the areas there brings those soundtracks back. But it adds so many new tracks, including the new overworld theme looking up at the sky which when i first heard that song i got goosebumps it's such an excellent song i literally sat there like I, I went to the open world and i said fuck i can't even engage in random encounters right now i need to sit here and listen to this whole track because it's so good and it captures the essence of what this game is the adventure you're on it's such a it's a perfect song i loved it but that's not <laughs> that's not even the best one there's even more there's um of course, Silver Will returning. One of my other favorite tracks, which this is kind of a spoiler song, so look it up at your own discretion. The Dream Continues. Just so good, man. The Enforcer theme. The new boss themes. Incredible. The new areas you explore. The vocal track, which, um, that's the thing from first chapter. There was the light motif that constantly played. You know, you know the song. I'll include little snippets here so you all remember. But <laughs> the, the leitmotif that constantly played, uh, it, it continues here, and it's so good. <laughs> I love the music, man. What more can I say? I love it so much. <laughs>
spoiler section, why don't we? There's a lot more to discuss. If for whatever reason you haven't played this game yet, go play it. You can get it on Steam anywhere between $10 and $20. And I don't know what you're waiting for. It's, it's literally one of the best JRPGs of all time. One of my favorite games of all time. And uh, what more can I say? So, shit really goes down with Chapter 3. Where it starts out, we met this girl, Ren, early on in the game, and she was with her parents, like, oh, we're we're visiting. We're from Crossbell, which, you know, having only played the Sky games, I do know about the other areas. Like, well, they've already, in the game, in this game here, they mentioned Calver, right? And then Erebonia. And I do know that Trails of Cold Steel takes place in Erebonia. And then Crossbell, that's Trails uh, to Zero and Azure, right? Those games, so... Ren is from Crossbell, and she's here visiting with her parents. And then, later on, you're, like, inquiring with the bracers, and it's like, oh, this girl is, is lost. Uh, there, there's a really cute scene where Ren is, is playing hide-and-seek, so you gotta go find her. And then, as, as shit goes down, as she keeps sort of disappearing. There's these ominous letters going around, all these threatening letters about war being imminent, where, meanwhile, you have the queen and the delegates of... Erebonia and Calvert trying to sign these peace accords, and, um, you know, it's not looking too good. So, eventually, th that woman, Captain Amalthea, from the first game, who was second in command behind Colonel Alan Richard, she shows up, and she has this fucking tank, which she's armed with a black orbiment, one of the Gospels, which, you know, in FC, first chapter, there was only one of them, now there's... Who knows how many? The Enforcers all have them. <laughs> and they're using them to, to fuck shit up. So she's there, ready to attack. The Black Orbin is making other people's orbments useless. And Ren reveals that she's Enforcer number 15, the Angel of Slaughter. And she also had like this divergence where she, she had this letter where she forged Joshua's handwriting. Because her being an Enforcer, she was very close to Joshua when he was an Enforcer. And that caused Estelle to make her way to one of the gates where she also met Father Kevin, conveniently enough. And then they fight these archaisms, these uh, mech-like things. And then they have to race back to the kingdom and get ready for a showdown with Amalthea. Which uh, Captain Julie Schwarz joins the party. And it's like, fucking hell, man. And there's also, a, before everything goes down too, Kevin uses one of his artifacts... To stop the Black Orament. So again, you see, you see firsthand that, that Kevin more than meets the eye. And this is when he reveals that he's more than just a wandering priest. And he's one of the Gralsritter. One of the Grail Knights in the Septium Church. Which again, <laughs> is that true? Or is there more to meets the eye with that fact as well? So you have this epic battle. Ren calls forth a mech of her own called Potamater. Uh, which, I don't, it's, it's fucking crazy, man. She, the, the two people who are with her early in the story, her parents, she chops their fucking heads off, but says, oh, they're not real people, they're just dolls, which they were. They weren't real people, they were, they were dolls. And then she calls forth her real mother and father, the Potomater, the, uh, the giant mech, <laughs> and she flies away, and she wields like a scythe, too, it's like, shit. So, I thought it was awesome you could use Julia in the party. That was great. Because we saw her in the first game. And she was really OP. And, you know, her S-Craft was awesome. And also, I should mention, Kevin's S-Craft. Uh, Grail Sphere. Which is so, just the voice acting of her. It's so bad. And she's like, I hold in my hand the chalice of heaven. May its holiest of light act as our shield. And you get max guard. If you have it up to 200, you get like two hits. Oh, it's fucking great. Always have Kevin in the party when available. So that happens. And then there are a, a few chapters in a row where you meet members of, of the Enforcers. Actually, even before that, I think it was chapter two. That's when you met Walter. You had to um, go back to where the hot springs were. They were all acting up. There were all these earthquakes. And then you go to where the source of the hot springs are. And you see Walter's fucking around with a gospel causing the earthquakes, just for the fun of it, just to test the gospel powers. All these early instances where you encounter the enforcers, they're testing their gospels to see what it can do. And Walter, it's revealed that he's a martial artist from Calvert. Hmm, 
hmm, where have we seen that before? And as the party's getting their ass kicked by Walter, Zinn comes in for the save. Such an epic moment, man. Oh, I loved it. So there's a connection between Walter and Zinn where they both trained under the same master. And Walter killed their master in a duel to the death. Really good shit. So you have all that. Uh, moving on to chapter 4. That's when we meet Luciola. And this takes us back to Roland. Back to Estelle's hometown. And there's a nice reprieve here where you can go uh, back to the Bright House. And there's a, a nice scene with Shara consoling her and the backstory on, on how Shara came to be and, and how she was an orphan and was taken in by the, the Harvey Circus. And it's revealed later that Luciola was also part of the circus and killed the leader there, the leader of, of the Harvey troop, who uh, Shara looked as, at as a father. So, some, again, some more crazy shit. The first instance of the game that made me cry when they make it to the mist area, the mist dungeon, and the, all the characters have like their dreamlike sequences, and Estelle is back as a little girl. And first of all, it's like, oh, Estelle, so cute. And you see her, she's, <laughs> she's always been a tomboy where she likes fishing, collecting bugs, and that whole thing. And you see Estelle's mother, and that really, that really broke me because. Like in the first game, we already knew this, Estelle's mother sacrificed herself during the Hundred Days War, shielding her daughter from the debris. So to see this scene again, and just seeing sweet innocent Estelle was so good. Um, in the dream, she finds Joshua's harmonica, which again, this is a whole dream sequence. It, obviously it's not there in, in the real Bright household, but it's a way for Estelle to snap out of the dream. And as she finds the harmonica, Number one, they say the harmonica was made in Erebonia. Cassius says that. He's like, what's an Erebonian device like this doing here? So, uh, more, more like subtle hints and foreshadowing to who Joshua is. And again, remember, he was visiting Hamel at the very start of the game in Erebonia. So she plays the harmonica and, and snaps out of it. And it, it reverts her sprite because she turns into like the little girl sprite and reverts her back to normal. And then you see the sequence of her mother... And I, I fucking cried, man. It was such an emotional scene uh, of her talking to her mother again, like saying, you know, I, I know it's it's you're not my real mom, it's just a dream or whatever, but I was so happy to see you again. And in return, the, the dream mother was, was saying, like, oh, you've grown so well. Give my regards to Cassius and Joshua, too. And it's like, she never even met Joshua. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> so emotional, man. So Estelle runs... And goes back to the to the real world, and, and you get a boss fight there. Oh, some really good stuff. And then while all this is going on, we have... It, it intersects... I actually predicted this in my review of the first chapter, how in between the chapters it would go back and forth to Joshua. And it, it shows, like, the Joshua cutscenes, the Ouroboros cutscenes. But then, at a certain instance, you actually play as Joshua. And this was some Kino attention to detail. So when you play as Joshua, you can go into the menu, and it says all the character names and whatnot. And at this point in the game, you should be around level 60 or so, and Joshua's like level 73. So showing how much more powerful he is, and he's working with the Kapuas as well. But his name, it doesn't say Joshua Bright, it says Joshua Astre, which is his, his name before he was adopted by Cassius. Joshua Astre. Which, uh, you can sort of say it like, a stray, like a stray from the path. I don't know, something that I thought of. <laughs> so, there's a sequence when you go back and you gotta get the bobcat. The bobcat that the Kapuas use, their airship. And while you're getting it, there's a boss fight against Mueller Vander. You know, the, the guy who's always with Olivia. And this boss fight, man, I... <laughs> I don't know how I beat it, but I, I beat it. And it's like, I think you're supposed to lose. But I did win. And Vander is like, damn, I didn't realize the kid would be so tough. So maybe the cutscene's different if you were to lose. But it's a tough fucking boss fight because Kyle and Don are in the Bobcat trying to get it started. So it's just Joshua and Josette. And she dies in two hits. You can revive her, she keeps dying. So you just leave her and you got to use Joshua. And it's like, damn. So, you know, you get that, you escape, and now, where are they going in the airship? 
So then we get to, to chapter five, and this is one revolving around Agi and Lo. And the, the big central focus here is that Lo, with the help of Weissman, they summon Ragnard the dragon, <laughs> and they, they put one of the gospels in Ragnard's head, which this dragon is just supposed to be a peaceful creature looking over a libero. And with the gospel, they turn into this berserk monster doing their bidding. So leading up to this point, we've seen all the other enforcers messing around. Uh, Blue Blanc was making like a hologram ghost of himself. Uh, Walter was causing earthquakes. Ren was sending the threatening letters trying to cause strife between the, the nations with Erebonian and Calvard. Um, Luci Luci Luciola was fucking around with the dreams, Estelle's dreams. And now we have Lo literally controlling a dragon and it crashes into the town of Bosch, destroying like their department store. Crazy. No civilians get hurt as far as I can tell. But <laughs> it wreaks havoc on all the cities and then it flies north. And Agate is pissed because that's, that's in the village that he's from. So you go up there and you see they have this orchard, like these farms and whatnot. And Ragnar burns it all down and Agate's pissed. So he goes up there and there's a one-on-one -on -one fight between Agate and Lo. And the fight is so keen -on. They're going at it. Silver Will is playing in the background. And Lo breaks Agate's sword. It breaks in half. And that's that. So then they fly off. There's like these epic scenes with, Ca uh, not, not Captain Morgan, he's General Morgan now. General Morgan leading other airships trying to shoot Ragnar. It, it's not working. It's like, whoa, man, this is, they're fighting dragons now. Airships versus dragons. And there's this really sweet scene where, this actually happened in first chapter as well, when, when Agate was protecting Tita. Where, after the sword breaks, Tita shows up and stands in front of Agate, protecting him from Lo. And again, Lo is a villain, right? But he sort of has like this the sense of, of honor. And he's like, okay, I broke Agate's sword. I showed him he's no match for me. I'm not going to hurt this little girl. And then he leaves. And then, Tita is looking after Agate. And man, this is some fucking excellent foreshadowing from first chapter. But in first chapter... Agate, when he, when he got injured protecting Tita, he kept mumbling his sister's name, Misha. And he's doing that again and again. And here, you learn that during the Hundred Days War, Misha was killed in, in the debris and in the crossfire. And in that village where, where Agate is recovering, that's his, his old house that they rebuilt. And you see there's a picture of Agate and Misha and that's why he sort of like looks after Tita as a younger sister now because he lost his younger sister. And again, another moment that made me cry. And it's like Agit is, is getting up. He's all bandaged and bruised trying to get up. And Tita's like, no, you have to stay down. I, I, I won't let you do this. I love you, Agit. Such, a, such an excellent scene. And I loved it, man. So with, with Tita, of course, having Professor Russell, he's able to modify... Agate sword to combat the gospel, the black ornaments. And they heal up for a little bit, and they get ready for round two, where they face off against Ragnard, and again, like epic scenes, the silver well music playing, and Agate uses his sword to, you know, break the, the black ornament and free Ragnard. And then Lo leaves, and, and then there's this scene. Because this is another thing, too, in first chapter, where Agate said, Okay, Tita, one day I'll take you to meet my sister. And I thought he really meant it. After the battle with Ragnard and freeing him from the gospel, Agate and Tita go to Misha's grave to pay their respects, to which they see General Morgan already there paying his respects. And this takes Agate aback because, you know, General Morgan's this no-nonsense military type. Agate doesn't like him because he feels he's responsible for his sister's death. But you see a soft side to Morgan here where, where he says he comes here every year to pay his respects because he, he's lived with this regret for so long. And in a sense, he sees that as his own fault. So I thought that was an excellent scene. Very well written. And Agate 
forgives General Morgan and is finally able to move on and accept that his sister died while still going to the grave and, and paying his respects. So as they're doing that, Lo shows up with flowers and he puts flowers near the grave and Agi is like, what are you doing here? Are we going to fight again right now? And Lo's, you know, I beat you right away. You've already seen that and never mind that, we're at a grave paying our respects. And they're like, well, why are you paying your respects there? Well, I know this type of tragedy. And he reveals the name Hamill to General Morgan, which again, early on in the game, Joshua was visiting Hamill, a town in Erebonia, or what used to be a town anyway, visiting a grave there. And General Morgan is like, how do you know about that? And Lo leaves with that, which, uh, that's some more shit in Chapter 6. So that's the end there. I love the title for Chapter 6, The Whereabouts of Bonds. So with that, our heroes decide to take a little break because, you know, <laughs> they just fought a dragon. They've had all this crazy shit going on. So it's like, all right, let's go here and take a little bit of a break. And... It was actually the area where Estelle first heard Joshua. I don't think it was the first time she heard Joshua play the harmonica, but when we played first chapter, Joshua was playing the harmonica out on this dock, and Estelle went out there to talk to him. And she she tries playing out there again as well, and perfects the song that she learned from Joshua. And all of a sudden, they see a boat come by with Kurt unconscious. Now, Kurt is another bracer, and... Father Kevin again, <laughs> he's conveniently there. He's able to use his church magic to bring him back to normal. And Kurt reveals that they found Ouroboros' base. So our heroes make their way there. It's like this research facility. And they go there. And they have to fight mind control versions of Annalise, Karna, and I'm forgetting the other guy's name. <laughs> but one other guy, one other bracer. So they fight all of them. And they make their way there. Uh, they, they see Joshua, or at least they think is Joshua. And Estelle is like, oh, it's, it's, it's Joshua, finally, you're here. And it turns out he's just a puppet. So you gotta fight him, similar to the puppet that we saw with Ren and her parents. And you fight him, and then you see Weissman, Lowe, and Campanella, and they... Kidnap Estelle on their giant airship, the Glorious. Which, prior to all these events, there was actually a scene where we had the Bobcat, right? Which which left uh, Muir along with Joshua and, and the rest of them. And they're, they're after the Glorious, this giant airship. And Joshua gets on a board, gets aboard. So we finally get the backstory about Hamill. Where Lo tells Estelle what happened, how Joshua had a sister named Karen, and Lo was sort of like an older brother to Joshua, and I think had romantic feelings for Karen, so the three of them were always together. Karen played the harmonica, the same harmonica that was entrusted to Joshua, and then again entrusted to Estelle. And they lived a very peaceful life, until all of a sudden... This group of Jaegers came in and ransacked the whole village. They killed everybody. They did unspeakable things to the women. And, you know, the rest is history. And what happened was... Joshua, being a, a young boy, he's like six years old here, fearing for his life, grabbed a gun to try and defend Karen. And shot one of the Jaegers. However, it didn't kill him. So he came barreling at Joshua and Karen with a knife, and Karen got in the way, sacrificing herself to save her younger brother. Now, this all orchestrated the Hundred Days War, because as I said before, it was a bunch of Jaegers, and Erebonia, because it's an Erebonian village, accused Liberal of hiring these Jaegers to, you know, cause the war, because it was Liberalian weapons. Liberal made weapons. So, that starts a 100-day war, and um, after the events, 
you know, they agreed never to speak of it again, and they, they said that Hamill was, you know, destroyed by a landslide or something like that. So, lots of crazy shit. Really heartbreaking scene. It, it makes a lot more sense because later on, they mentioned Hamill to the Queen. And there was a scene in first chapter when Lo takes off his mask when he was masquerading as Second Lieutenant Lawrence. He takes off the mask and, and he says, oh, you have no right to say such things, Queen or whatever. Uh, referring to Hamill. So that, given all this foreshadowing, like, God, I gotta play through these games again after knowing all this stuff just to see the foreshadowing. So Weissman tries to cut a deal, and actually, <laughs> there's a funny scene where Ren, you know, brings her along and is like, oh, you're, you're gonna join Ouroboros, right, Estelle? Come on, if you don't join, I'll gut you like a fish! It's like, what? <laughs> You'll gut, gut her like a fish? <laughs> and of course, Estelle says no. She's not gonna do it. So they capture her. And then, oh man, there's such an epic music, too. Estelle's, like, locked in her room, but somehow she still has her weapon. She still has her staff. <laughs> and she breaks the window, which causes the Jaegers to go in the room. And, you know, they think she jumped out the window, which she did. And then, like, she, she comes back in, attacks the two Jaegers, and then makes the escape. And then she gets to the roof, and there's, like, five Jaegers up there. And one of them reveals himself to be this guy named Gilbert who you may or may not remember, but he was the aide to Mayor Dalmore from the first game. <laughs> and it's funny, you have, like, the choice to say, like, who are you? Oh, I remember you. You're Mayor uh, Dalmore's assistant. And you start fighting them, and after a few turns, it just goes back to a cutscene. And then another Jaeger shows up, attacking all the other Jaegers, takes off his mask, and it's revealed to be Joshua. So Joshua and Estelle are reunited. And they're making their escape here. Because what happened was Joshua sabotaged the Glorious so that he can buy time. And Lo is the only one aboard the Glorious. While the other Enforcers and Weissmen are carrying out the next stage of the Gospel Plan. So they make their escape. They get in an airship. And it's one that doesn't have any weapons, of course. So there's three other airships pursuing them. When all of a sudden... The Bobcat shows up and, and defends them, and uh, they crash land near the beach. And again, uh, is anyone keeping track? Maybe I'll keep track in the editing. Another moment where I cried. When they crash land and the two of them are confronting their feelings, Joshua continues to say, you know, stop following me. I got to go my own way and fight Ouroboros. And Estelle is like, well, you know, why would you come save me if, if I'm here? Like, you, you stopped your plan because... Joshua's plan was to stop Weissman and Lowe right then and there. But he stopped all that to protect Estelle. And make sure she got off the ship safely. And they, they have like this, this beautiful moment with the music playing. The same theme that played during the dream sequence. Such an excellent song. The dream continues where they hug. And such a sweet scene. Joshua agrees to stand by her till the end. And that's when he joins the party again. Such an excellent scene. I absolutely loved it. So, next up we have Chapter 7, which again ties back to the first game. So again, how we kept traveling back to past areas. In the first game, there, there are these four towers. And if we do the math about the enforcers, oh, there's about four enforcers, right? So you got to go to these four towers to fight each member of Ouroboros. I think the order is Blue Blanc, Walter, Luciola, and then Ren. And you can bring whoever you want. The only mandatory party members from this point forward are Estelle and Joshua, and you can bring whoever you want. But if you bring certain characters, there's different dialogue choices. Like for Blue Blanc, if you bring Olivier and Chloe, there's, there's additional dialogue there because... <laughs> He has sort of a thing for Chloe. And then with Olivier, the two of them are trying to outdo each other for beauty. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, with Walter, you definitely want to bring Zinn. I think you actually have to bring Zinn. Yeah, I actually think it tells you who you need to bring. It's later on for the rematches where you, where you can select who you want to bring or not. But yeah, you bring Zinn, and the two of them have, have an epic fight. I love Walter's S-Craft, too. He lights a fucking cigarette. He's like, damn... Kids today, fine, just die. It's, it's such an epic voice acting scene there. So the two of them are fighting. After the, after the fight, um, 
they start duking it out. And then Killica, this chick who's part of the Bracer Guild, shows up, but also part of the Calvert Republic. And she shows up, and she has a connection to them as well. Because, remember I said earlier how Walter and Zinn were, were, were buddies and they learned under the same master? Well, the master was Killica's father. So how's that? And she has, like, these chakra weapons. Like, pretty badass, man. I wonder if she, maybe she's the party member in the third game. But anyway, you have that. Uh, then you fight Luciola, where you learn more details about her past with Shara. And then finally against Ren, which... <laughs> Ren asks Estelle once again, and Joshua, to come back and, and uh, join Ouroboros. And they're like, no. And... <laughs> <laughs> Red, like Red, the sweet little innocent girl, or so she seems, and then she's like, I'll gut you like a fish, I'll kill you. And right away, normally when you start a fight or a boss fight in in, uh, in this game here, you always get to go first. But right away, Ren uses her S-Craft, which is like, ready or not, here I come, gotcha! And she <laughs> almost one-shots everybody, like I always had Kevin in the party, so I could use Grail Sphere. But I couldn't, and I had trouble there. So you defeat her, and I think she summons Pot of Matter again. And then leaves. And then it was all part of the plan, and what happens is... They summon... <laughs> Weissman summons this thing called the Liber Arc. Right? <laughs> Which is this giant floating city in the sky. So before we can go there... All the power in all the uh, towns has gone out, so this is your way. This is completely optional, too. Uh, well, you have to go around to all the main towns and, and give them this device that Professor Russell makes. But you can go and do these other side quests, including one where you go back to uh, the Academy, and Annalise and Kurt actually join the party. So I thought that was cool. So you get lots of tidbits there. But so when all the power goes out, you know, you got to go around to all the, the different cities and put it back on. And then the, the kingdom is defenseless. So, of course, members of Ouroboros make their way there and attack. And they, <laughs> they kill, like, the whole army. They're all storming in. There's actually this epic scene where the Duke and his butler, Philip, are defending. And Philip, the old man, takes out his sword. He's like, I was... In the army years ago, I'll defend it. And it's like, holy shit, and the Duke, he was a scumbag in the first game, but now he's taking a stand to protect the kingdom. That was an epic scene. And they make their way there, the the queen is captured. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the cavalry comes and the special the, the, the special operations soldiers, the intelligence division with Colonel Alan Richard show up again. And remember, Richard was a, a prisoner because he was the villain at the in the first game. Although we learned that he was being controlled by Weissman, uh, he was set free by Cassius to help, and he does. And he's he's trying to clear his name. That was an epic scene as well. Uh, but as things die down, the enforcers leave to go to their uh, their floating <laughs> their floating island, their floating city. There's all these tanks advancing from Erebonia, and they're being led by. Major Mueller Vander's uncle, Zeke's Vander, <laughs> who has an eye patch. And to stop this, because of course, Erebonia, they say that they want to work with Liberal and put a stop to this, this floating mechanism. Um, and because their orbital technology isn't working either, they have the steam engine tanks. So Chloe, which I don't even think I mentioned this yet, but she's the princess. She's uh, the princess to Queen Alicia the granddaughter, and she goes out there as a delegate, and then we see a conspicuous blonde-looking fellow who had to leave conveniently like a chapter or so ago, Olivier, <laughs> which we knew he was an Erebonian, but now it's revealed that he's really the Imperial Prince, Oliver, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> he's the fucking prince, and he's trying to put up a farce like, I don't know who you people are. But it's all part of a plan that he and Cassius were scheming. So, oh man, such an epic scene. They, the Erebonians retreat for now. And Prince Oliver 
comes back and like the characters don't know what to call him. Do I call you Albert or Olivia? I will always be Olivia to you, my dear Estelle. <laughs> so that was some good stuff. And then finally, you make your way to the Liber Ark, the giant floating city in the sky. And the, the final chapter is called Trails in the Sky. So you make your way there. There's an epic cutscene with uh, the, the ship going up there. And then it crash lands. Actually, Lo pilots a mech called a Reverie Dragoon. <laughs> There's that word, Reverie, again. Because we have Trails into Reverie coming out soon. And he takes the ship out and it crash lands on the giant floating city. And before all that, too, there was another scene with the Bobcat, which crash land onto the ship, onto the, the floating city as well. So you make your way there. You fight all the Ouroboros members again. Uh, depending on who you bring in the party, you get additional cutscenes, like again with um, with uh, Blue Blanc and Olivier, um, Walter and Zinn. An epic fight between the two of them. Luciola, who actually <laughs> kills herself, I think. Anyway, they implied maybe she survived because she's she's an enforcer. But for, by her uh, intent, I thought she killed herself. You know, she she lost, and she's like, okay. I'm, I'm jumping off now. <laughs> Jumps off the tower. <laughs> and then Shara tries to catch her at the whip, which she does. But then she uses her fan to cut the whip, so she falls. So I think she died. I don't know. Maybe she'll appear in the, in the next game. And then Ren, where you fight her again. And afterward, uh, Estelle gives her a hug and tries to confront her. Say, you know, you're a little girl. You, you can't do this. Like, if you're an adult, I can understand you being an Ouroboros, choosing your... your you know, your own path. Because that's the other thing, too. They, they mentioned that Ren's parents left her. And Weissman took her in. And, I mean, she's just a little girl. And Estelle saying, you have your own free will. You don't have to do this. And she leaves on Potomater. And basically says she'll give Estelle a decision at a later date. So maybe in, in Sky the Third. So another thing to mention is that once you're on Liber Arc, I mentioned before that... The Bobcat crash land there. About halfway through the dungeon, you're reunited with Josette. Which, uh, <laughs> there's... I didn't really touch on this earlier, but there's some feelings and some tension between Estelle, Joshua, and Josette. Because, obviously, Estelle likes Joshua. It's safe to say Joshua likes Estelle. But then you have Josette who likes Joshua. And maybe to an extent, Joshua likes Josette. He's keeping his options open. And <laughs> there's constant back and forth with Estelle and Josette. Like, Estelle says, oh, you greasy tomboy, <laughs> you know. And still thinks of her as a villain, you know, from the first game. Although, they're not bad people. They become party members. Well, Josette, anyway. And, yeah, she does become a party member. And I love her S-craft. There's a scene where you have to go back to the Glorious and rescue Don, Kyle, and the other members of the Sky Bandits. And you get the Bobcat S-craft. Where Josette, like, fires a, a warning shot in the air. And it's like, over here, guys! And then the bobcat comes down. It's like, just firing all these fucking bullets. And then, <laughs> and then the bobcat leaves. And Josette, thanks, guys! Like, such a great S-Craft. The S-Crafts are so good. Maybe in editing, I'll, I'll have a compilation of uh, the ones that I like the best. Wanna see what I got?
I call this Requiem for a Doom Break. Yeah, here Take that! And a snake off! You ready for this? No! <laughs> Can you feel the despair? 
How does that feel? <laughs> Come, squirm for me! <laughs> After defeating the four main enforcers, there's the battle against Low, which is one of the hardest boss. It's even harder than the final boss, in my opinion. But you have an epic fight against Low. You're able to defeat him. Although, in the next cutscene, it's like, oh, I'm holding back. And then he has a one on one duel against Joshua, where Joshua is able to put all his power into, into one last strike and knock the blade out of the Blade Lord's hand. And. With that, Low concedes defeat and sort of make amend, makes amends and is like, you know, I understand everything now, Joshua. And they're able to talk about Hamill and Karen and what it is they're all looking for in life. And, and Low sees the relationship between Estelle and Joshua and is like, you know, I, I can't hurt that. And these, these guys are really fighting for something important. So, as they have a heart-to-heart, -heart, Joshua and Low hug each other. And then that, that fucking bastard, Weissman, shows up and shoots Low. Although he's not dead yet. So before the final battle against Weissman, because of that tattoo that Joshua has, the Ouroboros tattoo, it's revealed by Weissman that it's a thing called a stigma. And it's also embedded in Joshua's mind to do his bidding. And he's able to control Joshua again. His eyes turn red. And there's a fight where it's just Estelle and Joshua, and, and Joshua kills Estelle, or rather defeats her in one hit, and Estelle's lying there. And Joshua is ready to kill Estelle. And again, another really emotional scene where he's finally able to break free from the stigma, where he reveals by the help of both Cassius and Kevin Graham. So, that happens. And uh, then you get ready for the battle against Weissman. Uh, there's like three phases there. You fight him in his human form. Then he combines with the Ariel, <laughs> I think it's called. <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> essentially becomes God. They call him Angel Weissman, but he's, he's essentially God because of the JRPG. And then there's another form where you fight him. And at first you can't do any hits on him. And... Lo gets on one of those Reverie Dragons again, Reverie Dragoons, I think it's called, and using his sword, which he, he reveals was given to him by the Grandmaster, so it has this innate power in it, breaks the shield, and our heroes are able to attack and finally defeat Weissman. So after all that, the fucking <laughs> floating city is coming, crashing down, and our heroes have to escape. With the Liber Arc being destroyed and ready to collapse, our heroes have to make their escape. And if you pay close attention to the cutscene, you'll see the whole party go one way, and then Father Kevin go his own way. And he actually confronts Weissman by himself. And this was revealed early on as well. Weissman is a former member of the Septian Church. So Kevin being part of the Gralsvritter, the Grail Knights, confronts him. And you know, starts calling him a heathen, and takes out his crossbow, and shoots him! And it's like... You know, is one crossbow gonna stop him? We just had three phases with him, we didn't defeat him, how's that gonna stop him? And it fucking turns Weissman to stone! And for the first time, like, all game... Kevin's portrait has always been, like, smiles, and, you know, happy-go-lucky. For the first time, his portrait has, like, a scowl on his face, like... Anger. And there's like a quote where it's like, this is your final judgment. And he's like, why why would they use you to, to kill me? Like, what's the deal there? And he's like, oh, I'm the number five. Like, what the fuck does that mean? I'm the number five. The number five what? And Kevin says something like, oh, the church tries to remain neutral, but we can't overlook what you've done. So Weissman turns to stone. And then fucking Campanella shows up, and he starts laughing like, Oh, this has been a treat. A pleasure to finally meet you, Father Kevin. Oh, oh, oh. He calls him the Heretic Hunter. <laughs> so, he destroys Weissman, who's been turned to stone. It's like, what, Campanella destroyed him? I have much to report, 
a good day to you, and he leaves, and it's like, well, <laughs> what the hell is he, he going on about? So, lots of crazy stuff there. Uh, and as everything's being destroyed, of course, the party is, is making their way out. Uh, Estelle and Joshua get separated. There's some debris. It, it destroys the platform they're on, so they have to go their own separate way. And Estelle and Joshua make it outside, but the same thing happens. And, you know, they think they're going to die. So Estelle says, you know, I have two things before we go. Can you hold on to me tightly? And can we get a do-over of that first kiss? And again, another moment in the game that I cried. Got teary-eyed. And as they're holding each other tight, the platform is unstable and they fall. Now, playing the game, I, I, I knew they couldn't die. I mean... They can't. They're like the main heroes. Uh, that would be a, a, quite a way to end the game, but they, they can't. They just can't. And would you believe if I told you that both Cassius and Ragnar the Dragon were there to save them? And that's when you get the, the song, the lyric song, I Swear, which starts playing. As the dragon is, is flying, and then you see the whole crew with Tita at the... At, the front of the ship waving and just such a sweet scene with the credits rolling a beautiful ending an absolutely beautiful ending and during the credits you see all the different instances of our characters doing what they want to do in the world and it, ugh, it was so well done I absolutely loved it and at the very end there's there's a scene where Estelle and Joshua Go back to Hamill, go back to the to the grave, Karen's grave, and Joshua leaves the sword, Lowe's sword there, and Estelle is holding flowers, and you know says I'd like to to say something to Karen if I could, and and Joshua says you know go ahead, and Estelle says you know I've been his replacement sister for so long, but no one could ever replace you, that's for sure. I guess now I'm kind of his girlfriend. <laughs> Just such a sweet scene. And oh my god. And then you got like the artwork scene where the two of them are looking up at the sky, holding hands, and talking about their next adventure, what they're going to do, um, and how they're going to stop Ouroboros. So a, a really terrific end to the game. I absolutely love this game. I, I, I can't praise it enough. It's just, it's fantastic. And, um, you know, for anyone who watched this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> maybe it went on kind of long, but <laughs> this is what I do here. And after beating the game, you know, I spent 90 hours on the game. I tried to do every side quest I could. Before starting Sky the Third, I, I just had to do this and get it all out there before I start Sky the Third. Because I'm sure once I do, then maybe... If this review would be different, you know, it's like I, I know other things because I already I have so many questions about Kevin. There's also Weissman mentioned another another um, member of the Dominion Church, and or maybe it was Campanella. Someone mentioned it, and Kevin was taken aback by it. So there's a lot of interesting stuff about him. I do know that Kevin is the main character of Sky the Third. He's the protagonist of that game, so that'll be interesting to see what that's like. I'm probably going to start that either tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> so, in another month or so, look forward to my review of Sky the Third. But again, I absolutely love this game. Thank you guys so much for watching this video if you made it this far. And, uh, you know, give it a like, subscribe, leave a comment. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. So, thank you so much. Have a great day. And peace out.